first time we talk about it on Tennis Legends. So okay. we're trying to get to know it a little bit more. Yeah. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm with Richard Krajicek, former Wimbledon champion and number four ATP in 1999 and now the Rotterdam ATP 500 tournament director. Nice to meet you, Richard. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so the tournament was created in 1972. It's the 51st edition. Arthur Ashe, Jimmy Connors, Roger Federer won the tournament three times. You actually won it twice in 95 and 97. What is your best memory of this tournament as a player? Yeah, I think we had like a small tournament uh, early 70s, but we really start counting from 1974. Uh, Tom Walker won that uh, event. And that's why this year is the 50th uh, anniversary for our event. Um, and uh, my earliest memory is uh, 1982. I was a spectator. And I watched Guillermo Villas play semi-finals against Buster Mottram from England. And it was 6-4, 6-4. And um, I actually have two memories from that uh, match. One is that Buster Mottram was coming in all the time. And Villas he has, was lefty and had a good touch. So he was passing him, cross-court. But he had a lot of these lobs, like running lobs, like this with spin. And he would win the point like that. And by the time he lobbed Buster Mottram for like the 10th time with a winner... The crowds, you heard some laughter, like they were laughing at the opponent of Guillermo Villa. So it was a bit uh, yeah, awkward, actually, to see that the people are laughing at you. But uh, so that was one memory. And the other memory was that same match. Um, I had a can of uh, uh, soft drink. And uh, in the old days, uh, you had to open a can in a different way to pull off like a, like a lid in a way. And it was really difficult. So I tried to pull it off and I spilled all the Coke on the front the man in front of me so that was also an interesting moment so um yeah 1982 i won't forget that and what about you as a player you have a special memory when you won maybe or another yeah year? i think uh, well that uh, the first time i won actual match point I, I tore my meniscus so that was not a nice i still won that point so i won the tournament but the second time i won was a very good memory for me because uh I uh, came back, I was there as a Wimbledon champion. So it was in February 97. In 96, I won Wimbledon. So yeah, I was uh, the first time I played again in Holland since I won Wimbledon. So it was nice to win in my country as a Wimbledon champion. Is Rotterdam kind of Roland Garros for you guys? Uh, is it the same prestigious thing to win at home? Uh, well, for all the other tournaments except the Grand Slam, uh, for me, it was the, my biggest uh, win. I won, uh, uh, of course, Wimbledon. That's for me the biggest. And then I won two 1,000 events uh, or three even. I don't even know. I, I won Stuttgart uh, twice uh, and I won Miami. Uh, but I also won two times in Rotterdam. And for me, the two times in Rotterdam, I for me, I feel, I yeah, um, I don't know, more important. But yeah, yeah for me, the, it's ranked in the top three of uh, important tournaments that I won in my career. Could you party with your friends maybe after because you were at home? <laughs> nah, no, I quickly, I, yet, I had to go to the next tournament. The next day, I I think I flew to Marseille to play or something. So it was, yeah, as a tennis player, uh, I didn't feel sometimes a lot of time to celebrate. No. How did you actually become the director? And who was the director before you? Uh, the director before me was a man who almost did it for 20 years. Wim, Wim Buitendijk was his name. The trophy is named after him. Um, yeah, he did an unbelievable job growing the tournament from a small indoor event to the, the big indoor event it was. So, um, uh, but he got, unfortunately, he was sick and he passed away before my first tournament. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so that was uh, actually sad. So uh, I was asked to, to take over and um, that was in 2004. So I retired in June 2003. And then already uh, my predecessor was really uh, ill. And, and actually, basically, from that moment, I took over because you have to go to meetings with uh, tournament directors at Wimbledon, at the US Open, and also the World Tour Finals. So uh, already then in 2003, I was doing basically uh, uh, all uh, everything and uh, as a tournament director. And then that first, the first tournament was uh, February 2004. And when you say doing everything as a director, what does it mean? What do you actually do? Yeah, what you actually do is 
um, well, the first year I had tried to do everything because I thought the director is responsible for everything. So you have to do everything. And doesn't, that was not so smart because yeah. I, I was, and by Tuesday during the event, I was so tired already and I was not happy because I was uh, felt responsible for everything. But the, the, mo the most important thing is uh, that I create, the, or I say I uh, get the player field. So talk to the agents. Uh, sometimes a little bit the players, but mainly with the agents, try to get good players. Uh, I'm responsible for all the meetings with the ATP, other tournament directors, but also um, uh, make sure the relationship with the ATP is good. In 2007, there was the Brave New World, uh, and they were uh, making uh, new sanctions, basically, for the tournament and new levels. So, um, yeah, I had to lobby and talk to the people at the ATP and... Uh, yeah, we, we managed to get the 500 sanction, which upgraded our tournament. Uh, so that's important. Uh, I'm also the, I say, the, the spokesperson of the tournament with the press. I'm talking to you now. And uh, so that's important. Create yeah, Exactly. <laughs> so create attention uh, in the media. Uh, also, you know, when things are good, you know, I, I talk about, you know, if we have a good winner or something. But also sometimes we've lost all our seats uh, by Thursday, and then I have to go to the press also to give a press conference that okay, we don't have any players left. So, in good times and bad times, I'm the, I'm the like the face of the tournament, the spokesperson during the tournament. Um, yeah, I run throughout the whole uh, stadium basically. I talk to the people, uh, the regular crowd basically, to the main sponsor, title sponsor, ABN Emro. Uh, there's a lot of we have about 35 suites. I visit them. Uh, during the week, I visit all of them uh, for 15, 20 minute talks. There's a lot of seminars uh, organized by by companies that uh, the sponsors that are there. So I, I also uh, come there for 10, 15 minutes to talk to the people. They have questions for me. A lot of times talking about the matches that they're going to see. So during that week, it's really busy. And during the year, I think the main thing is uh, going to the ATP meetings and getting a good player field. And then, of course, we have meetings uh, about how we're going to uh, organize our event next year. How many things are we going to change? What do we keep the same? Uh, so, and then I'm a part of a team and trying to get the best um, uh, possible player field and, and and get the best possible tournament for everybody who comes to our event. And today is Wednesday. Do you yeah. do you handle better than Tuesday a couple of years ago? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was twenty years ago. This, this is my twentieth anniversary as tournament director. So, yeah, the first two years, I yeah, exactly. <laughs> So 20, the, the first two years, I was, especially the first year, but even the first two years, I, I needed like a holiday for like two weeks after the event. But then I, I uh, yeah, I relaxed more. I understood like, okay, let's work my strengths. Uh, what am I good at? Actually, the things I was talking about still is busy, but it's different. And we have a great media team. We have uh, our operational manager and everybody uh, working uh, in the back office. It's, it's so strong, so good. They have 50 years experience. And um, yeah, and, and now, now it works perfect. You know, it's a bit physically maybe tiring, but uh, yeah, I actually get energy from 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 the tournament. You know, so uh, it, it's so much fun. It's it's such a special week in the year. Uh, it's something we worked towards for fifty one weeks, and yeah, I wouldn't say it's like a one big celebration, but it's like hey, we worked at this. It's great. Let's let's enjoy. It. Let's have the, have a great week. So uh, yeah, no, I feel I feel great. It's Wednesday feeling good and the only important thing to do is because we're an indoor event that sometimes during the day I have to go outside for 10-15 minutes just to get some sun and some fresh right. air if possible yeah. or, or else sometimes if I really stay in all day that by the end of the day I'm like I feel like I didn't get enough oxygen almost but uh, that's uh, the only thing the rest is good you look fit I'm sure you're, you're doing great um, <laughs> how many ATP 500 are they on tour I think at the moment there are 13, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I think we're the first 500 of the year. Uh, in our month, there's a couple of 500s, like Rio is a 500, Dubai is a 500, Acapulco is a 500, but I think that maybe it's already in March, I'm not sure. So there's four, but we're, never, we're not in the same week. Um, so yeah, and uh, then of course you have uh, Barcelona is a 500, Hamburg, end of the year you got like Tokyo, uh, Beijing. So, um, and uh, uh, Basel and Vienna. And Washington is also 500. And of course, the two grass court tournaments, Queens and Halle. So are, if you are, counting, I don't know how many, that, but those are the 500s. Are you the one with the biggest budget? 
Um, we have a good budget. I don't know. I have the feeling China always or Dubai and China <laughs> right. have a, maybe a bigger budget, but we have a, a good budget. We have incredible, if I say so myself, VIP also, and everything built for the spectators. I mean, uh, we don't only have our center court, which is a great stadium, but we have all these holes uh, attached to it, expositional, so many. We have six practice courts uh, oh. uh, and really good practice. Players love it. And I, they should, you know, I agree. It's fantastic. All the same courts, exactly the same as center court. Uh, so they can practice a lot. We have a great gym uh, and uh, a lot of things for, for the spectators. Uh, we have shops and we all build it only for this uh, week. And but all without one tent. It's all uh, under solid roof, basically. And that makes it so special. And with huge VIP with like 32, 35 uh, units and ABN Emro, our main our title sponsor, receives 15,000 guests for the week. Wow. Yeah, it's and amazing. How, so, how yeah. many seats are there on the central court? 10,500. 10, we nice. sell about 115,000 seats total for the event. Um, and about 50,000 of that are uh, a, a, a VIP, basically. Wow. So it's businesses inviting guests. So uh, it's the biggest networking event in, uh, in Holland. And how much does the tournament cost? Uh, well, we have prize money of over two million, um, and um, yeah, and and ABN Emro uh, is, is of course a good sponsor, the title sponsor. So they, uh, uh, I think, uh, their sponsorship is over three million. Wow, amazing! And yeah, I've read that the the winner of the tournament earns three hundred eighty seven thousand this year, and obviously mm -hmm. five hundred eighty p points, sixteen k for first round. And 127k for the winners playing double, but the the special thing is that this year it's plus 70% on the total prize money compared to 2022. How do you explain that? Um, well, we uh, there's two ways to explain, or not one way, but uh, two things happened. Of course, last year, uh, or and, and the last two years, we didn't have any hardly any spectators, and then our, our prize money was cut in half. Okay. Uh, because uh, what the, the players agreed like okay right. uh, tough times so uh, you have to look at compared to three years ago and and um every um every year the there's a special formula the prize money at least goes up i think two percent or two and a half percent and then there's also some revenue sharing at one point so it depends how much revenue we get so, but the 70% is there, you should compare it to 2009, uh, uh, 2020. If okay. you compare 2020, then that percentage, uh, then you can see really how much the price money went up because that was our last uh, non COVID year, normal yeah. year. COVID year. Yeah. Got it. This year, Tizi Pass is the number one seed, then Rublev and the defending champion Felix Orge Aliasim come third seed. Do you have any bet from the heart for a winner? This year, maybe Botik van der Zonschul, I don't know. Oh, he was, yeah, he won today, seven, six, and a third. He was struggling. I was I was watching just before. Oh, we okay, you were watching. Yeah. Yeah. So set four two down. I was like, oof, not looking good, but he got out of it. So that's great. Uh, yeah, it's tough to say. There's so many good players still. So I mean Rublev, but he's gonna have a tough match against the Minauer. Uh Tsitsipa struggled a bit, but he won uh in yeah, first round always difficult. Same with Medvedev. So, yeah, I, I, I yeah, it's it's a tough one to say. I mean, for the moment, I would say easy. Of course, you look at Tsitsipas, you look at Felix Auger, Aliasim. He won Rublev. He won it before second seat. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think after tomorrow, uh, after Thursday, they've all played two matches, and then you can gauge a little bit who is playing well. I have to say, who is really who is playing well at the moment is uh, Grigor Dimitrov. And in terms of style, which one do you like the most? Um, yeah, I, th I think Dimitro is a great player to watch, but I love Stemmerinka also. But um, and Felix also because he attacks a lot. So that's about the same with Tsitsipas. I mean, there's so many guys. Yeah, I love watching them, and uh, they bring all of them bring so much energy to the court. And I think that's 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 the most important thing, no matter what your style is. But uh, my hope that we get one of the top players like. Uh, um, um, uh, Zver, uh, Zverev uh, is also coming back now, but Zverev, Felix Auger, or um, Tsitsipas, Rublev in the final against the Dutch guy. For me, uh, 
it would be great. We have the top player, and then for the emotional uh, bond, basically for the crowd, it would be great to have the home guy. So also in the final, and then I don't think I care who wins, but that would be my dream final. And have you coached also on tour? I coached a little bit. I coached uh, uh, Raonic a little bit for a couple of months, Milos Raonic, and I've coached Tamarinka one year on the grass. Nice. Uh, not a successful year on the grass for him. And I coached him from Reithoven also a couple of years ago. And at the moment, uh, my son, he's ranked about 550 as a coach, but he asked me to travel with him for about 10 weeks a year. So he's, uh, he's, he's 22 years old. He's ranked 550. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's also uh, fun. So I think that for the moment is uh, as, uh, tra traveling with my coach, uh, with, my, with my son a couple of, a couple of weeks a year. Do you have any news from Milos Raonic? Is he getting better from his injuries? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. No. Okay. Um, I've heard that in Acapulco, for example, they they have budget to attract uh, very famous players. For example, I've heard that a couple of years ago it was one million for a top three player, then one and a half, then we don't know about one and a half, two million for the top three. Do you have this kind of budget to attract the the stars on tour? Um, no, we, I don't know. No, not really. No, uh, we, we, maybe if there's like a chance to get like a Roger Federer, then the budget changes. But in general, we have a, a one set budget that we don't disclose. And uh, and we were with this budget. The, the players you see now, we were able to get with this budget. And um, it's been the same budget for the last, I don't know, seven, eight or 10 years al al almost. So, uh, yeah. So I think somehow we, we managed to get a good field. I think the most important thing is um to get uh to have a good tournament like you good points 500 but good plays in the calendar and that's why um acapulco can get good players i mean there's, i'm sure they have a certain kind of budget but most important is it's before on hard court close to indian wells so it, it makes so much sense for the players to come there because of course finance is important but uh, before you talk finance, the player look, does it fit my schedule? Does it make sense? Is it a good tournament? Do I get enough points? All these things. And if that all makes sense, then you talk the last part about uh, the financial side. So you have a range for to attract uh, top, top five, top 10, top 15. Is that how it works? No, we have certain budget. So it's like one big budget or like one, one whole budget. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, let's, uh, let's see, uh, let's try to get... Yeah, a lot of uh, as many top 10 as possible. Uh, let's, uh, a couple of Dutch guys uh, and also 11 to 20, we think is important. Maybe a few names like Stemmer Renka, who's not in the top 10, but still uh, will sell tickets. And, and then uh, with that, uh, we see what, uh, how far we get. And uh, we try to get yeah, at least, uh, I think, um, three or four top 10 players. This year we have five, even two from the top five. And we had five from 11 to 20. And we, yeah. of course, Kachanov pulled out. Yeah, and, and like that, uh, you, you make your, uh, your field. But uh, we, we like to have... Our goal is that the first three days of the tournament, every session, we have uh, at least one top player. And uh, I mean, our, our field this year is so good. And the guys keep on winning that we had to put Stemmer Rink on court one. We had to put Grigor Dimitrov against Hurkacz on court one. I think that shows how strong our field is this year. So, uh, yeah, we try to uh, be able that everybody, that when they buy a ticket, and you don't know when the player is playing a match uh, before, you don't know until the day before, but if people buy uh, two weeks before a ticket, that they'll know they'll see top tennis. And that's our goal with the player field. Can you share with us that budget or is that top secret? No, I, I told you it's that we don't disclose it, but uh, it's a good budget and uh, we have a good feel. Yeah. And how much is a ticket to like average to come I to think, see the show? I think our average ticket is about 40 euros, I think. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're not, uh, we haven't raised the prices that, that much. Uh, we've raised, of course, but not unbelievable. Yeah. Have you said earlier the tour is nonstop? It, like right after is. Marseille before is Montpellier and then all the guys and the girls go to, to the US. What makes uh, Rotterdam special and unique? Um, yeah, I think a couple of things. I think we're an indoor event. We're European. So for the European players who come after Australia, it's nice to be back home a little bit and that you don't have to travel that far before you go to the States where you have to go and to Inuel Skibeskane. Um, I think because we're 500 events, so you can make good points. 
um, I think, great facilities uh, for training, for matches. And, um, and I think what's important for us, we have a very strong tournament with Marseille next to us. So it, the players can play more than one tournament. I think if there would not be Marseille and no, no Montpellier in front of us, it would be a lot difficult because then you're basically on an island. And uh, so also the uh, we're very happy with the two French tournaments uh, around us. That uh, that makes the uh, it sense for a lot of players to to play in Europe. Yeah. And in terms of the city attraction, do the player discover a little bit? Is there something to do in Rotterdam? I've never been there, so I cannot. Uh, tell. Huge we port. Have, no? uh, we have uh, we have uh, we have some good restaurants, and uh, the rest. The thing is, no, it's winter. So even if it would be the most amazing city. It's a it's a fine it's a good city a lot of architecture a lot of modern architecture because in the Second World War we, the the city was leveled by the Germans so everything is uh, a lot of buildings are new so a lot very good architecture and uh, so that's interesting to walk through town to be, uh, and some bridges because we have a river there some very special looking bridges so um, but uh, the thing is it's uh, cold outside so not <laughs> not Quebec cold uh, but it's cold. Do you live there the rest of the, the year? No, I, I'm born there. I was born here in Rotterdam, but I live about an hour drive uh, in a small village. Uh, yeah. yeah. The tournament is also involved through the, the wheelchair tour. Can so, you explain? Uh, last two questions because I have to go again, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That one and then uh, okay, two minutes. Perfect. Okay, go with the wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, so it's involved through the wheelchair tour. Can you explain us why some tournaments do and other don't? be part of the the wheelchair uh circuit yeah I, I cannot tell you why they don't but i can tell you why we do uh 15 years ago abn emro uh, came with the idea like we think it's good at wheelchair from uh yeah like a, a responsibility feeling like okay we have to uh, in include and uh wheelchair players uh, uh um, I say uh, disabled uh, sports, we, we find that important. They say, okay, we agree. And yeah, after like five years or even after maybe yeah five, six, seven years, we're like, yeah, this is not just for to include, but it's like, it's top sport. I mean, I saw how hard they were training, the wheelchair players. I, uh, the, 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 the matches I thought were really uh, good and they're, 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 it's so physical that I, uh, we were like, we should yeah, see how can we make this one tournament, you know? So we talked a long time about it and we see it as top sports. And now we changed the name from our tournament because before it was called the ABN Emro tournament and the ABN Emro wheelchair tournament. And now we said, no, we are one tournament. So it's ABN Emro open for the, the, the ATP event and the wheelchair event. And we added also women's wheelchair uh, tennis. Uh, we have a Dutch girl, Dieter de Groot, who won, I think, the last 13 Grand Slams. She won Olympic gold. Uh, she's totally dominating. And uh, I see her at the National Center because they're also the wheelchair players and and the, and the ATP and WTA players to practice uh, at the same facility, same center. Uh, and I see how hard they work in the gym, on the court. So, uh, yeah, we, we, for us, it makes total sense. And especially at this time when everything is inclusive, uh, this totally fits uh, with us, and I'm really happy that a we had the tournament 15 years ago because it was the idea of our sponsor, and now I, I cannot think of our event uh, not being together anymore. Yeah, I've seen that the total prize money for the wheelchair is 70k. Do you know how much the winner gets? I couldn't find the info. Oh, I have no idea. I, I, no? I don't know how it works. Like uh, in ATP, it's always about 20%. Uh, so I guess it's around that, I'm sure. All right. Okay, so last uh, two questions for your memory. Do you remember what happened during the 1984 final between Connors and Ivan Lendl? Yeah, it's legendary. It's the only final, only year that there's no winner. Uh, I think after the first set was 6-2 for Lendl, I think. There was a bomb threat. And um, yeah, we had to... Uh, I wasn't there, but uh, the, the crowd, uh, the spectators had to leave the stadium and uh, and the final was never played. In 2001, do you remember what happened with the French player Nicolas Escudé? Oof. He qualified and actually won the tournament. Ah, okay. And he also won in 2002. Yeah, Good I know. Job. Yeah. Good job, Nico. In and 2003, in... he beat me. 
Oh, it was nice. my last uh, my last time uh, playing there. I lost them seven six in the third set. Oof. Remember, yeah, actually, yeah what's it felt like the, that. <laughs> remember what's scoring the tiebreak? No, probably like seven four. I I didn't feel like I had really a chance to to win the tiebreak. So he played good. And was... last one in two thousand eighteen, something quite historical happened after the final. Do you remember? Um, after the final. Well, I mean, Roger uh, we, Federer became the oldest number one after the quarterfinals, of course. So um, that's, that's it, yeah, 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 after, that's it. But it was after the quarterfinals already, he was the, and then of course he won our event against Dimitrov. So yeah, it was for me when people ask me what's the most important memory for you, I said, well, well, my first year as tournament director for myself, yeah, it was the change from tennis player tournament, but in my whole career as tournament director, it's 2018 to be able to witness tennis history. Roger Federer becoming the oldest number one and how the people uh, reacted to it in Holland, the crowd, I mean, also international press, everything. Yeah, it was uh, really special. It's the last time he played and I'm happy it was the last time. It's the, a great memory for such a great player and a great person that we uh, remember him like this, basically, uh, that he won there, number one. It was just one big celebration. He was actually 36 years old. Thanks a lot, Richard, for taking time, wishing you the best for this edition, and maybe I'll meet you next year. Who knows? For sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.